Today we're going to read 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 through 25, and then chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth parts of a cab of doves stung for five pieces of silver. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, and the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hands the king leans answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gates. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore uh, come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Now Pastor Chan will come and preach. Oh. Sorry. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into the into one tent and did eat and drink and carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Now Pastor Chen will come and preach. All right, you may be seated. Well, I don't usually comment on current events in the news, certainly not politics, generally speaking. But as a nation, as a country, we have become heartbroken as we have heard and, and as we have read the fall of Afghanistan by, milit by the militant Taliban and our American people and our allies, those in Afghanistan who have supported our cause have become entrapped in that country, unable to get to the airport Kabul to be airlifted out in safety. We understand that those who remain are in a double jeopardy, in a serious and a terrible quandary between a, hard, between a rock and a hard place, you can say, or in the common vernacular, Damned if they do and damned if they don't. They can stay where they are in their houses, but the Taliban, as we're told, are going house to house, hunting out Americans and those who support the Americans. But if they leave their houses or their place of refuge, they'll be easy targets for torture and instant death. But then just staying where they are, even if not found, they then enter into a Taliban world country under Islamic Sharia law, which is the least of all these evils. Think about that. 
And in our passage this morning that Brother Jesse read, we have a similar situation, a similar scenario. There are four lepers sitting outside the gate of the city of Samaria. Samaria. We're talking about the northern part of Israel, the northern part where the northern tribes of Israel rule. King Jehoram reigned. And the Syrian army besieged the city, surrounded it, and camped around the city. And they're waiting it out. And King Jehoram and the people of Israel within. The mighty, the army was too mighty for them. If they escaped, they would be instantly killed and slaughtered. And so, as was often the case in the ancient world, the Syrians held their place there cutting off the lifeline of their communication, of their food, of their water, allowed them to become so weak that they would begin their attack. And there was these four lepers there in that context. Lepers, I talked about that last week. A leper is a type of sin. Somebody estranged, cut off from the life of God and even from the people. And leprosy, as I mentioned, is a type of sin. It illustrates how God sees us because we're all, all born spiritual lepers. We don't see ourselves as that, to be sure. But God does. Look up, please. Time and time again, God wants to show us how he sees us. He already knows what we think about ourselves. We think we're awfully good. Because we compare ourselves to other people. But all of us fall short of the glory of God. God is not in our thoughts. And so we do not have God's holiness, his awesomeness, his glory, his honor, his virtue in our mind. And we are people, as one may say, in the horizontal, living upon the earth as a man under the sun. Not thinking about God. And so... God, in his mercy, throughout the Bible, gives metaphors and pictures of what we are really like to try to cut through the chase, to blow the bubble of our own self-esteem. And so in God's eyes, we are all leprous men and women filled with sin, disgusting, putrefying sores from the head to the foot. And now in our account, we have four lepers outside of the city they not only have their leprosy to contend with but there is a more immediate manner for them to deal with and that's seen in the discussion that they have with each other which is my text this morning second kings seven three and five the four leprous men speak to one another why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we stay here, we'll die. If we go there, we're going to die. And if we, we die also, now therefore come, come guys, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians, their enemies. Remember, the Syrian army was encamped outside the gates of the city. They were sitting outside the gate all throughout the New Testament and the old. Leprous men, paralyzed people, would sit outside the gate of the city where all commerce was made. People talked about things. We, we read that in the book of Ruth, for example. A lot of commerce and a public forum, as it were, at the gate of the city. And so the leprous men sat at the gate of the city because in usual times they would beg for from those entering into the city and exiting the city. But as I've said, this is a wholly different scenario. And they knew it. And so they asked themselves these questions. And they concluded, now therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians outside the city. If they save us alive, we will live, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Remember, they're gonna die anyway, either here or there. So in their own estimation, they had nothing to lose. 
Keep that in mind. Nothing to lose, even though the prospect wasn't cherry. Even though the thought of falling to one's enemies is not something that one would want to even remotely consider in any circumstance, but this circumstance was dire and different. They're going to die here or there. We, at least we have a glimmer of hope if we fall humbly, contrite into the hand of our, what they, who they thought were their enemies. And if they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up. Last Sunday, as I told you, I preached on leprosy and the title of the message, as Brother Associate Mello said, the loneliness of sin and Jesus compassionate cleansing. And we go on from that, keep that in the background, but now put the present circumstance in the foreground. When the four lepers rose up and went to the Syrian camp, they were bewildered, they were surprised because they found an empty camp. And not only that, remember they were starving. They depend upon people in the city to traverse through the gates of the city. No one was doing that. So they were hungry. And they went to the Syrian camp outside the gates of the city. And he found food galore, roasted lamb, still warm, goat's milk, bars of gold and silver and fine raiment. And they thought they found heaven. Not only did they have salvation from what they thought was clear and present danger, imminent death in the Syrian camp to their surprise and to their ecstasy, they found Wealth and freedom galore. And for a moment, they ate and they ate and they drank and they drank and they took the bars of gold and silver and the fine raiment and they buried them. They thought, this is too good of a thing. It's not, not going to last. And then they came to their senses. These were lepers, but they were Jews as well, as was the case last time when they presented their leprosy to the priests instructed by Moses. And so they thought, wait a minute, guys, our people in the city, the Northern tribes of Israel in the city, in the camp, they're having a famine because they had great famine inside. And the chapter describes, the end of chapter six and in chapter seven, describes how awful the circumstances were. Because when the Syrian army besieged them, encamping around them. They just waited their time, waited their time, waited the time. And the people in the city were starving and thirsty. And there was extreme, extreme inflation to the point that people ate things they would never disgustingly eat before at great sums of money. In fact, chapter six of Second Kings says they even resorted to cannibalism. They were so desperate. And so the lepers, having come upon this great wealth, having stuffed their stomachs and filled their mouth with, with wine and all this wealth, they thought, I got to share this good tidings with my brothers and the sisters in the camp. And we'll talk about that later. Now this, as I said, is an illustration of the grace of God and the salvation that he wants to bring to you who are lost, who do not Christ, who are a leper. And I want you to follow. And if you follow along, and if you received what the word of God says about you, and I want you to try. I know you don't consider yourself as a leper, as a sinner, but God makes it plain that you are full of sin and unacceptable in the sight of God, cannot approach God. And when your body dies, you will experience eternal death in hell and the lake of fire in this life with sin, unforgiven sin. You're separated from the life of God. You don't know God. You might talk about God. You might come to church, but you don't know God in a living way. 
You see, that's eternal life. Jesus defined it. This is life eternal, that they might know the one true and living God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. We put that banner up, John 17, 3, on, 17, on Central Avenue, John 17, 3. And that's a wonderful scripture text to tell the world what eternal life is. Eternal life now through fellowship, intimate knowledge, personal acquaintance with God through his son. And that's the message I want you to pay attention to because we're going to go deeper. It starts with the lepers outside the sea, but then they're dealt with a choice. So follow me along because the storyline is simple, but the message is so, so important and so striking about how God gives salvation freely to all. Point one, first, if you stay where you are, I'm, this is an evangelistic gospel sermon. So if you, you being lost, you being outside of Christ, you don't know Jesus, you don't know God, your sins are not forgiven. If you stay where you are, and as and remain as you are, you will die in your sin under God's judgment. Why sit we here until we die? Clearly, follow me now, clearly the lepers will die if they just stayed there as they normally did. Remember, in normal times, they just sit there, sit there begging for people coming in and out. Remember, they had leprosy. Perhaps part of their bodies were deformed. Perhaps they were very weak because they were malnourished, but they were sitting there waiting and wholly dependent upon the mercy of others to give them, to feed them, to sustain them, to nourish them. But they sat amongst each other under the circumstance. Why are we sitting here just waiting to die? They're starving. If they didn't move, there would be no hope at all for them to live. Right? right? Think very simple. But the same thing can be said of you. Remember I said, outside of Christ, you are a leprous sinner, filled with sin and in the eyes of God, disgusting, filthy, cut off from the life of God. So apply it to yourself. If you sit where you are, if you remain where you are in your life, apart from God, apart from Christ, if you stay and remain the way you are, you will die. Now the lepers were looking at a physical death. There's a spiritual message, of course, but they were referring to a physical death. But the application to you this morning is a spiritual death and of death in general. It's such a horrid event to be avoided at all costs. How much more eternal death? And so if the lepers ask among themselves, Friends, why do we just stay here, sit here, and die? There's another passage where sinners also talked among themselves in a sort of encouragement, exhortative way to encourage each other in a negative light. Who among us shall dwell in everlasting burnings? It's a similar question. One is one of escape in the present case. The other is that who among us is going to hell because all go to hell except they're in Christ. So you should think, think seriously because you are in a place and you are in a condition that is not safe. You're under the judgment of God. And unless you have the sense, I can't remain as I am. Now I'm not talking about the physical maneuvering. I'm not talking about the physical traveling, but I'm talking about a position change. The Bible says in Adam, positionally in Adam, all die. And so these lepers in Adam, they're all gonna die. They're positionally in Adam. They were born in Adam, positionally, and they remain in Adam. You don't have to do anything to be in Adam. You just stay the way you are. The hope is that you become in Christ. Because in Christ, there is safety, there is salvation, there is mercy. But right now, leper, 
Right now, sinner, you are in Adam and you're not safe. It's a bad position to be at, bad place to be at, to be in Adam. Use the metaphorical mind, I'm not talking about a physical locale. I'm talking about a position, a spiritual position, and you are in Adam, not in Christ. And you must become in Christ. You must be transformed to be in Christ. So you can legitimately ask yourself the question, why sit I here until I die in Adam? Because in Adam all die. And why does why do all in Adam die? The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 12, wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, wherefore by Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, sin leads to death. And so death passed upon all men because sin passed upon all men, death passed upon all men through Adam. Remember, how do I get in Adam? I don't want to be there. Well, you're stuck in Adam unless you are in Christ. In Adam is the default. And you must go through the process of conversion, of trusting Christ. As Brother Kuhn said, you must present yourself as a contrite, humble, guilty, helpless sinner that cannot improve yourself. As the leper cannot put nitre or, 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 or soap on himself to cleanse himself. So you cannot clean up yourself before God. The sin is deep. The sin is within. And you must be cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. Or you will always remain dirty, filthy, and a leper in the sight of God. We are all born with sin, inherent sin called depravity. And throughout our lifetime, we merely add to that. By sins of commission. And by sins of omission. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Going astray is a picture of sin. Going astray from the will of God. All we like sheep, all people are wandering, meandering away from the will of God. For all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And that's why different people have different prerogatives in sin and lifestyle. It's, a, it's expressed in different ways. But the root cause is the same, sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own particular prerogative way of sin. But the adversative, thank God for the verses in this verse. But the Lord, the Lord God, Yahweh, had laid on Jesus the sin of us all. We wandered. We went astray. We went our own particular way. And we should have paid for that. But God in his grace and mercy laid that sin, that wandering, that rebellion, that sin against God upon Jesus. He's our substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus. Think about Jesus. The four lepers outside the gate is a picture of you. Because you too will die spiritually. And you too are sitting Sitting is a picture of passivity, of rest, if you will. And so ask yourself the question. Insofar as trying to be changed, to have a new nature, you have a sinful nature in Adam. Are you trying, does it bother you that yet you have this sinful nature? You've heard about Christ. You've heard about the offer of salvation. But time and time again, you close your ear to the beckoning call of God through Christ. As he says to come to him, as he says to trust him. You stay where you are. You're content the way you are. And you're sitting, as it were, sitting, resting, content, like the lepers were before the famine. They were content to beg, to have that kind of life. What about you? Content in your condition. You see, that's the application. You must move from where you are to where you ought to be. And you got to listen to the sermon. Think about it. Cogitate. Consider. Reason with God. Because he is trying to reason with you. 
is trying to convince you that he's right. And not only that, oh, that, that he's right, not only that he's right, God doesn't just want to win the argument. He doesn't want to only persuade you, but he wants to offer you forgiveness of sins. It's all for your benefit. He's not arguing to win an argument. He's God. But God is condescension, like Brother Roop said. We cannot, we cannot conceive the condescension of God that he would even consider us, much less give us his son, but he has. And what about you and what is your attitude? Are you sitting at the gate of the city, content where you are in your position in Adam? Or are you moved to see I'm filthy, I'm like a leper, I can't clean myself, but I must be clean because to know God, to have eternal life, to, to have God in the spiritual world and the, the world of the Bible to be open up to me? Or are you content with just the physical world of just getting a job, of just saving some money, of just getting married? You ought to get married, but that's not the end all and the be all. You ought to do and enjoy life in this, in God's world as much as you can because God wants you to. Let me just say that Christianity is not a religion of just that's boring and that's that's not fun. That's not true. The book of Ecclesiastes addressed that to young men. God says, and I'm paraphrasing, enjoy thy youth. Walk in the days of thy youth. Enjoy yourself. But just remember, whatever you do, you have to account to God. God gave you free choice. And you can choose to sin, remain in sin. Or you can be persuaded and think seriously and see that I'm wrong. I'm a sinner. I need to change my mind. I need to trust Christ. God has given you another, yet another chance today. Will you squander it? Again, will you remain sitting passive? Or do you think there'll be another opportunity for you? Will you squander the opportunity? Will you treat God like you treat other people that are not important to you? Remember, God doesn't need to do this. God is God. You've sinned against him and his law. He is offering you salvation full and free through his son. You've rejected his offer countless times. And so I encourage you this morning, don't just sit there passively, engage the mind, the heart, and say, I must move. I must not remain in Adam, but I must be in Christ. Second, God has provided a means of escape from his judgment through Christ. Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit and we shall, and we sit still here, we stay here, we shall die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. Now, follow me here. They're logically on the spot. If they stayed where they were, they would die. If they went to a place of famine, they would die. Look up, please. Look up, please. They would die if they stayed here. They would die if they stayed there. If they fall into the hands of their enemies, they will surely die too. But there is still a glimmer of hope that there might be mercy found in that situation. Because in the old world, when the enemies presented themselves, sometimes the enemy did hold them captive as the Egyptians did to the people of Israel. Could they be abused? Of course. But there are other cases where they're not so abused. So they were hoping, there's a glimmer of hope there. It's not automatic that I will die. And so they reasoned among themselves and they reasoned rightly. And they fell upon the mercy they thought of the Syrians and any goodness that they might have for them. They had to make this choice. And they thought, I could never make that choice 
They never thought they would be in this scenario, much less having to voluntarily fall into the hands of their enemies. But they did that as their last resort. And they were so glad that they did because God in the meantime was working behind the scenes. We have the famine in the city. We have the Syrians ostensibly outside besieging them, surrounding them. We have the perspective of the lepers. But I told you when the lepers came, there was empty. Why? Because God brought the sound of numerous chariots and horses of the armies of the Hittites and the Egyptians and the Syrians thought they were going to be massacred outside the gates. And so they fled in haste and they left everything behind just like the Egyptians did when Israel left Egypt and they, they plundered the place. There was food, as I said, lamb, goat's milk and the rest for their plunder. Now that's a picture, I want you to think about this. That's a picture of the grace of God. Why am I saying this? Because there's some people here that cannot fathom in their mind that of becoming a Christian. Yes, I know. There are some here who think, I don't want to become a Christian. That's going to tie me down. I'm going to have to go to church every week. I'm going to have to go to evangelism. I'm going to have to read my Bible. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. And I don't want to do that. And so your perspective is like the lepers outside the gate. Perhaps you have received some of the message that you are in sin and under eternal judgment. And you are debating that. You are considering that. What if it's true? That's an outcome I don't want to have. That's death. I don't want that death. Perhaps you think about the world. I'll have fun in the world. But maybe you thought, well, you know, the world's not as fun as I thought. And you're thinking maybe that's a dead end too. And you've thought about Christianity. Some have. But you can't quite get yourself to become a disciple, to become a regular attendee in the local church. Why? Because you think, I don't want to do that. I don't want that commitment. And you see, the way of your thinking is similar to the lepers. They thought, I'm going to die here. You've received the message. I'm an Adam. I'm a sinner. You're not fully convicted of sin, but you're thinking maybe it's true. Maybe when I die, I'll go to hell and the lake of fire. You've explored the world. Been there, done that. You had your pleasure in sin for a season, but you know the answer is not there either. And the other alternative, becoming a Christian, is not so rosy to you too. And you think, just like the lepers, you know, I really don't want to do that. They're probably, it's not going to be good, but that's the only choice left. But I want you to think, that's what the lepers thought. But when they got there, they were so glad that they chose that alternative because they found food and drink and sustenance and glory. You see, that's a picture of the riches that you have in Christ when you come and become a real Christian. You thought, this isn't so bad. This is, it's really true what the brothers and sisters said. Coming to Christ has opened up a new avenue in my life. I thought it would be drudgery. I thought it would be boring. I thought it would be a yoke and a chain. And that I would have to force myself to go to church and they'd be keeping calling me. And I didn't want that commitment. But you'll be surprised if you come to the place where you see that you're in sin and under judgment. And you see that the world ultimately has nothing to offer you. And you consider Christ and the life of a Christian. You too will be greatly surprised. When you come to Christ and experience a new birth, the Bible says that eye has not seen, ears have not heard, neither have entered in the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. 
I can speak as much as I could about the glories of Christ, the peace that passes all understanding, the great inheritance of the saints. As was said this morning by Brother Roop, Christ preparing a place for us. I can tell you about all those things, but it doesn't do justice to the experience that God through Christ can give you because a relationship with God is eternal life. I can only give words. I cannot convey the feeling, the position, the experience because it's real. We have a living God. And when you come to Christ, your soul is quickened. And when you come to Christ, you experience peace beyond all, beyond all human understanding, inexplicable. We try to speak of our unspeakable gift, but we can't. But the enthusiasm for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to promote the advancement of his kingdom is what's in our hearts. And you too, you can never think that I will be like that. But let me tell you, if you come to Christ as a guilty, convinced, hopeless sinner, you think, well, you know, it's going to be hard, but what else can I do? And you come to Christ genuinely, you experience the grace of Christ, and you will be transformed beyond your wildest imagination. And you think, how can this be? What transformation has taken over me? That's called the new birth. That's called being born from above. That's the life of God in the soul of man. And when God through his Holy Spirit is in you, you become a transformed person. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can't imagine, but that's a promise in God's word. Remember the Bible says in Adam all die. Even so in Christ, shall all be made alive. Come to Christ and you'll be made alive. You're now dead in Adam, but in Christ you will be made alive. And point three. Third, come to Christ who will save you as you lose your life as his disciple. Where does that say that in your text? Pastor Chan, let me show you. The leper said, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall in the host of the Syrians. And their words are reminiscent of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. You see, there is a measured risk of becoming a Christian. Yes, there is. Because if you want your life to be saved by Christ, you must voluntarily lose your life for Christ. No such thing, my friend, of coming to Christ as Savior without coming to Christ as your Lord and to be his disciple. And we see that here. They made a measured risk. If you fall in the hands of the Syrians, we might but die. If they, if they save us, if they... If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. You see, coming to Christ, like their decision they made in their soul, it's a dual one. You come to be saved by Christ, but you come to die. Brother Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a man to come to him, he calls him to die. Yes, he does. And that's the call to discipleship. Jesus said it, Luke 9, 23, 24. And listen very carefully. If any man will come, you want to come to Christ? Okay, come. If any man will come to Christ, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. Yeah, if they sat on the gate, the four lepers, I think I'll just sit here. If you save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life, for Christ's sake, you shall save it. You see, when you come to Christ for salvation, you come for forgiveness of sins, but also, you also come to be his disciple. And if you try to disengage the two, you simply have not come to Christ. Because when you come to Christ, you take Christ. He becomes your own. You can't divide Christ. 
Like Paul says, is Christ divided? No, he's not divided. He's Savior and Lord. You call him as Savior, you come to him as Savior, your sins are forgiven, then automatically, as proof positive that you've come to him for salvation, you will follow him as disciple. In the Old Testament, there we have it. By the lepers themselves. And we see their discussion. The lepers, when they're in the camp of the Syrians, remember what they said with Brother Jesse just read, 2 Kings 7, 9. Then said the lepers one to another, we do not well this day is a day of good tidings. Or we could say the gospel. Today is the gospel. They found the gospel. And we hold, if we hold our peace, we don't say anything about it. If we tarry or wait till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come. Brothers, come that we may go and tell the king's household. They found salvation, you see, and their conscience go to them. Let's not wait till the morning because our brothers and sisters in the camp, they're dying of famine. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm talking to the Christians now. You come to Christ. You found the great wealth and blessing and joy. Spiritually, you are to the full of food and drink, of wealth beyond gold and silver and fine raiment. You found the glories of Christ and of salvation. Do you have the compulsion? Do you have the urgency of these lepers who illustrate evangelism? I must go and tell. Do you have the spirit, the heart of the Samaritan woman, of the angels who beheld the star over Bethlehem and the angels telling them, that he has brought them good tidings to men of good will. What about you? Talking to brothers and sisters now. Where is the urgency? Where is the incumbency? Where is the, the need to spread the, the good tidings? Do they still remain good tidings to you? And if it is, in that your perspective, if you're not backslidden, filled with your own ways, Restore unto us the joy of thine salvation. God's salvation given to us. Restore to us. Brothers and sisters, we need to be revived in our evangelism. Not only why sit here till we die, but let's not let those around us die too. Because these good tidings of the grace of God in Christ must be spread abroad when you look at People out there, do you see them in spiritual famine? Do you think about those who do not, who are dying on the vine with no spiritual life? Do you see them as sheep without a shepherd? Is your guts moved like Christ was when he had compassion on the sheep without a shepherd? Let us have spiritual eyes to see there is a lot of work to do. There are many people around us. Our brothers or sisters, our mothers or fathers who are spiritually starving without life, the life in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Love how, let us have compassion on them, urgency about them, and let us go. Let us be people of action as illustrated in the Old Testament among these lepers, fourth and last. Fourth, you must actively seek Christ if you are to be saved. Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the sea and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. They save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up. They didn't just talk about it. And so, friend, I'm talking to those who are lost again. You must understand you're a leper. You're not well. You're not in a good place. You're full of sin, putrefying sores, cut off from the life of God. And when you die, you will continue your life without God in eternity. Hell was not made for men. It was made for the devil and his angels. God has provided a way for you not to go to hell. 
But by neglecting so great salvation, that's the default location. So think, the scripture says that I'm a leper. I was born a leper and I do the sins of a leper and I'm filthy. Yes, I could be clean compared to everyone else. But everyone else is not your judge. God is the judge of all. God's whose eyes are in every place beholding the evil. And how fair are you? How do you measure up to God's standard? You don't. Nobody does. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. To not only pay for your sins, so you're not guilty. But Christ gives you his righteousness. So you can have a relationship with God. And if you come to Christ, not only will your sin of leprosy be cleansed, but he'll give you a clean garment of righteousness. And you'll experience all the bounties of God's grace in Christ, as I've said. Don't hesitate to come to Christ. Don't think, I don't want to do that. I don't want that commitment. Rather think, I can't stay the way I am. I can't stay the where I am right now and, and who I am right now because I'm under judgment. The world has nothing to offer me. God, I will fall upon the feet of Christ and I will give up my life and discipleship, but I need my soul to be saved. What a great exchange. What a great master. I said the other week, all of us serve a master. Jesus says, you cannot serve God in money. But it could also be said, you, we all have a master. If you could choose a master, you can never choose a better master than the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He died for you. He's praying for you. He lives for you. And all he asks, that you love him and live for him. And he'll give you the strength to do that. You see, it's not enough. I'm almost done. It's not enough to know about Christ. Many of you know the gospel. You know about Christ. It's not enough even to be a disciple. Many people here are in some sense a disciple. No, you must sense. I'm still a leper. I must go to Christ for cleansing. I must be clean. I must be transformed. I must have forgiveness of my sins. I must know God. I must find the purpose of my life. I want to have true direction in life. I know I'm guilty before God. When I stop comparing myself to others, I know in my heart that I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. Everybody knows that unless you distract yourself. And then I've tried the world. And it was fun for a season. But it doesn't satisfy. It just doesn't satisfy. Try Christ. And you'll be surprised. Don't be biased with what you think about what Christ and being a Christian is like. Think about the glories of the promises of God. And the direction that Christians have in serving and loving our Savior. You must rise up now. You who are already a disciple, you who already know the gospel, now is a day of salvation. What if those lepers said, oh, let's wait a minute, guys. Let's wait a minute. Too late. They said, let us arise. And so I charge you this morning, afternoon. Arise, my soul, arise. And come to Christ. He has healing beneath his wings. He's waiting for you to cleanse your every sin, give you a purpose and meaning of life. And when you know Christ, you will be so glad and all your biases, all your prejudices, all your misconceptions about what a Christian is and what life I will live. You know, it's all voluntarily. It's all voluntary. A Christian never does anything he doesn't want to do. I'm not saying it's never hard, but it's driven by not our love for Christ, but driven by Christ's love for us. The love of Christ constrains us. Not our love for Christ, the love of Christ constrains us. And the love of Christ will constrain you and keep you. Let's all stand. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that thou use a simple message to speak to someone who's lost here this morning, who sees, Lord, that they have to make a choice. Lord, it's not on them, but in this Bible example, you will bless an urgency and a desire to be cleansed because you show grace and mercy and you surprise even the hardest sinner who if they but acknowledge their sin offense and come to thy son, they will be cleansed and transformed and have great peace and happiness. Be blessed indeed. Lord, I pray that thou wouldest draw one, escort one, persuade one to come to Christ. Let them know the joy of sin forgiven. Help the Christians, brothers and sisters, help us, God, to share the glad tidings far and wide to those who do not know thy son. Bless the food that we're about to receive, the dear ladies who prepared it. And bless our fellowship, God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Your excuse.